Amen. Amen. Thank you, man. Well, if you got your Bibles, I want you to open up this morning to Colossians uh, chapter 4. We're actually going to be finishing up our series uh, called It's All About Jesus. Uh, it's actually a, an incredible day to have uh, Thomas and Dustin, who have been uh, just a huge part of our church in multiple ways, whether it be at this campus or Dublin or Savannah uh, or in Athens. They've all uh, been and served in multiple roles in, in that capacity. Um, and so we've been looking at this book of Colossians where Paul's writing to uh, the church here at Colossae and he's proclaiming them and, and really just exhorting them and encouraging them uh, to make sure that Jesus remains the focus, right? He's, he's t encouraging them uh, that Jesus is Lord, uh, that Jesus wants to work in your life. And today uh, the passage is, is absolutely incredible. But it's one of those passages when you read it for the first time, it's really easy to kind of skim over it. Like, man, is this a genealogy? What is this? But I believe God's got some gold in here for us uh, to, to learn. So let's read together. We'll start in verse 2, and we'll work our way through it. So devote yourselves to prayer. He says, being watchful and thankful. And he says, and pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Remember, Paul's in jail as he's writing this. Verse 4, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Verse 7, Tychicus uh, will tell you uh, all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our, fa our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, uh, Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instruction about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved uh, a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for your joy and for, for, for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give, me, uh, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and to the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, See that it is also read to the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So at a first glance, again, this chapter can, can, can seem almost like a genealogy list, and he gives us those names, and we can kind of read through them and not give them much thought. But here's the idea that I want you guys to take away from today, and I want to teach a little bit about this. Uh, everybody in the New Testament, everybody who reads the New Testament will be very, very familiar with Paul, right? Paul is an incredible figure that we see, a person who planted a ton of churches and could take credit for a lot of the church planting that we see uh, really around the Mediterranean Sea. And, and, and so when you get to a chapter like this, it's almost like Paul's going through and saying, hey, here's my, here's my friends or here's my crew. Here are the people uh, that, that roll with me. But I think what we need to understand today is that God wants to teach us something incredible about his church and his kingdom. And here's what I want you to write down. Uh, this one. Uh, first thing, God's church is a team sport. God's church, God's kingdom is a team sport. It's never a, about a one-man part. It's never about a one-man show. You know, God's design, it's about, if it is a one-man show, it's all about Jesus, right? But when it comes to the church, it, it's a team sport. It wasn't designed to be about one person. It was designed to be about a body. When, when Christ thinks about the church or thinks about his kingdom, specifically uh, in the church, he says the body of Christ. Christ is the head. He's the kind of the one-man show, the one that we glorify, 
but then all of us make up the body, one hand, one eye, you know, one leg, one foot. We all kind of serve in different roles, unified in making much of Jesus. I want you to think about the greatest sports teams ever, right? We could argue about what that is, but most people, if they're honest with themselves, know that the greatest, one of the greatest teams ever are the Bulls in the 90s, right? You have Michael Jordan, you have Dennis Rodman, you have Steve Kerr, you have all of these, Scotty Pippen, you have Tony Kukoc, all of these different guys that come together on this one team, right? And they win uh, three championships in the early 90s, and then they win three championships at the end. And one of the things that you see about great teams, whether it be the Bulls or the Warriors or, uh, you know, you name it, the Braves back in the day when we used to win uh, all the time, but whatever you're looking at, Great teams are made up of great players that play their role. You know, one of the things that in the documentary that Michael Jordan put out or they put out about Michael Jordan, you see these guys, uh, one of the things that the GM was focused on was bringing in players that played specific roles that would make the team better. So he brought in Dennis Rodman and everybody was like, dude, you're crazy because he's crazy. But Dennis Rodman could rebound and he could play defense. And that's exactly what the Bulls needed is that attitude and that defensive. And he brought it in. And what happened is they worked together as Michael Jordan was a scorer. And you had Dennis Robin who could play defense. Scottie Pippen, who was the great uh, assist person around, around Michael Jordan, came together to function as an incredible team. When you think about the church, that's the way that God wants us to think about the church. It's not just about one person. There's no Michael Jordan in the church. It's a team. It's a team sport. That's what God wants us to understand. It requires many faithful men and women working together for one common purpose. Every person has a purpose, and that's the concept that God wants us to understand when it comes to his church. This is not only the plot that, that, that Paul's pointing out to us in Colossians 4. This is the, the kind of the story of the whole Bible, right? When you start reading uh, through the Old Testament, you see God pick out ordinary individuals and then surround them with other ordinary people and begin to lead them. If you look in the book of Acts, you start to see persecution breaks out. People scatter everywhere. And as people scatter, ordinary people become uh, the, the, the host for these home churches, these house churches that God begins to stir up and move in a way that it spreads throughout the entire world. The good news of the kingdom of God is that there, there's, there's no Michael Jordans. There's ordinary people filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that God uses to do incredible things. And so God specializes in using people just like you and me to do great things for his kingdom. J.D. Greer, one of my favorite authors and pastors, says this way. He says it this way. Ordinary people, people with problems and faults and stubborn habits and personal weakness can be used mightily in the mission of God, because it's not about their abilities to do things for God, but it's about his ability to work through them. It's just such an incredible principle to understand when it comes to who God uses and how he uses them. And this is exactly what I want to talk about today, is Paul's faithful team. The overarching question that I want you to ask for today is, are you on the team? Are you a faithful team? saint? Are you a faithful uh, uh, Christian in the work of what God is trying to do? And I want us to see that in a couple ways. Paul's going to help us see what it looks like to be a faithful team member when it comes to being on the team of the church or on God's team. The first way is to be faithful in prayer. Listen to verse 2. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too. that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And so the first way to be a part of the church, God is asking us not to do everything, but he is asking us to be faithful in a few things. And one of the things that he wants us to be faithful in is this idea of prayer. And he talks a lot about uh, prayer, being steadfast or being faithful or being consistent in prayer. But the letter A, the first thing I want you to know about prayer is that the Bible teaches that prayer is powerful and effective. 
right? And so uh, for us in our culture, prayer is kind of a normal thing. But a lot of times prayer becomes ritualistic for a lot of us, right? We kind of pray the same things and we pray at the same times every day, maybe before we put our kids down to bed or maybe uh, before a meal or whatever it is. But prayer is different when you see it in the Bible. Uh, Prayer is always the first response of Christians and not the last resort in Scripture, right? You you see this idea in James 5.16 where James says, the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. We say it this way at Connection. Prayer connects us to the power of God. We don't have the power, but when we pray, we call on the one that does have the power, and he begins to intervene with us. So Paul teaches to be persistent in prayer. The word persistent means to continue steadfastly. Jesus taught the same principle in Luke 18. He taught us to pray and not give up. Don't ever think that we're annoying God by praying, right? If God was annoyed by prayer, he'd be very annoyed with some of us. If God was annoyed by prayer, he'd probably not be annoyed by many of us because we don't spend much time praying. But he says, listen, don't think that God doesn't want to hear you. He does. So he says, make prayer your first response and not your last resort. He told us to ask and keep on asking. If, if we keep on asking and nothing happens, he says, keep on asking. And then he says, be devoted to prayer. Listen, Acts 2, 42, it says that believers, when they were saved, they were devoted to four things, and one of those four things was prayer. Devoted means to be committed to, to, to give our time and our energy to prayer. They prayed in all circumstances in the book of Acts. When good things were happening, when bad things were happening, uh, we're, we're just worshiping God. Prayer was central in what their relationship with Jesus. Because we serve a God that's sovereign. He's in control. And if he's in control and he's all-powerful, then you think about all throughout the Bible. It teaches that God can do more than we can ask or imagine. For some of us, we need to start praying some God-sized prayers for our life for our children, for our church, for people in our life that we think are too far gone. Listen, if God can shut the mouth of a lion, if, if God uh, uh, can, can take down a pharaoh in Egypt, and, and, and if God can break chains that are holding a prisoner and open prison doors so that his people can continue to build the church, Why would we not call on that God? God's asking us as a church to be faithful in prayer. He's asking us as as individuals to be faithful in prayer, to be steadfast. What's not happening because we're not praying? You know, one of the things that Francis Chan said early on when I became a Christian, I heard him at a a conference, and one of the things that he said was uh, he was talking about prayer. And he was talking about this idea of if, if he said, he, he was talking about just how uh, lackadaisical we are when it comes to intentionally praying. And he said, man, if, if you prayed a word for every word you texted on your phone, how much more would be happening in the kingdom of God? And I thought, ah, man, you know, because as as you, you don't think about it. But, but for me, my, my issue with praying is lack of intentionality many times. And so uh, this year, one of the things that, that my wife and I have done is, is we've started journaling intentional prayers. Like we came up with a list of every day, Monday through uh, Saturday, things that we wanted to pray for, intentional things. And, and, and so what we've tried to do is be intentional. We're not perfect. We, we miss days and, and things come up. But the, the thing is, is we're trying to be intentional about praying specific things and praying for specific things in that. So how, what does it look like to be faithful in prayer? Well, I think he gives us a few things. The first thing he tells us is to be watchful. It's like to pray watchful prayers. Watchful is a, a Bible word that you may not know what it means, but to be watchful means to be alert, to stay awake, right? If we don't know what's going on, then we don't know what to pray for, right? If we don't know what's going on with the people of God, then we don't know how to pray. He wants us to be informed. Not just pray and go through the motions or pray ritual prayers because that's what we're supposed to do. He wants the believers to be alert about issues in which our Christian brothers and sisters are walking through. This is what small groups are all about, to know what's going on in the lives of people around you so that you can intentionally pray for them. Why? Because prayer is powerful 
and effective. You can't change a person's heart, but God can. You can't change a person's situation, but God can. And so as we begin to hear the needs of God's saints and the needs of people and the needs of of things in our community, our prayers are huge in making things happen. He also says to pray thanksgiving prayers. He wants us to spend time thanking God. You know, gratitude is one of those underestimated things in the Christian life. You know, if, if we would just think about things in our life that God has blessed us with and spend more time thinking about everything God's blessed us with and less, things think, less time thinking about things that we don't have, how much in better shape would we be? You know, the gospel produces uh, thanksgiving in our heart. When we begin to reflect on all that God's done for us and all that God's done, but we're, we live in a culture that doesn't uh, like to do thanksgiving, right? We like to eat. But we don't want to have a conversation about what we're thankful for. But God commands it in the scriptures that we be thankful in every circumstance. Because as we begin to reflect on all that we're thankful for, our hearts begin to be where they need to be. It it guards us against greed and covetousness. It keeps us from not being focused on what we don't have, but it keeps us focused on what God's blessed us with. It's one of the primary ways that we fight being discontent in our life. Spend some time thanks, thanking God in prayer. And then he goes on to pray missional prayers, right? So we're not only praying watchful prayers and being alert about what's going on, we're not only praying thankful prayers about things that God has blessed us with or things going on that we need to be thankful for. He says to pray missional prayers. Paul always asks for open doors to share the gospel. Paul uses this expression an open door many times in Scripture. We see it in Acts 14. We see it in 1 Corinthians 16. We see it in 2 Corinthians 2. He uses this expression, open door, when he's describing situations in which his witness was particularly effective. That is where God was at work, right? You, you see it in, in several different places. 2 Corinthians 2, I'll just read that one. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ... Even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. Right? So uh, he's saying (laughs) he's linking his effectiveness at ministry with his prayer for open door for ministry. If we want to be effective for the gospel, we need to pray that God would give us open doors. And once the door opens... We need to be stepping through it. When's the last time we prayed, God, where are you opening doors for me to begin to minister to people around me? Because listen, you on your own power can only do so much for God's kingdom. We can't change people's hearts. We can't talk people into following Jesus. If we do, somebody will talk them right back out of it. But when God's working in a person's life, the good news of this is that you can't do anything to mess it up other than just not walk through the door. Just jump alongside of God in what he's doing. Pray missional prayers. He also says pray for clarity. Clarity and boldness when it comes to sharing the gospel. Why do we need to pray for clarity? The Bible teaches that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. That means when we proclaim the gospel, we need to pray that God would help us clearly proclaim the gospel to people in a way that they can hear it. Right? One of the the challenges with preaching to a crowd like today, is that I can't have a one-on-one conversation with you, right? So I don't really know what every person in this room is walking through. If I did, I could speak the gospel into that situation. If you're wrestling with a lie about uh, the enemy has told you that you've been believing, then I can speak the gospel into it and say, no, that's not God's truth. That's a lie from the devil, and you need to believe God's truth and not that lie. You know, but what what we have to do is look for opportunities. And when we get that opportunity, God wants us to be able to communicate the gospel clearly, right? So think about the encounters that Jesus had with different people. You know, Jesus didn't walk around with a tract and share the same thing every time, right? Though that may be easy, it's not effective in a lot of places, right? Some people will get mad at me about that, but I'm just being honest with you. Jesus shared the gospel in different ways with different people because different people hear it in different ways. It's the same message, but it's different context that it goes into, right? When he walked up to the woman at the well, he saw that the woman at the well was filling her life uh, with, with, with sexual sin. She was looking for something in men that only Jesus could give her. 
And so what does he do? He goes straight to it and says, hey, you're trying to drink from this well that's never going to give you what you're looking for. So let's talk about Jesus who can give you what you're looking for. And he shares the gospel, and she gets saved. Then he walks up to Nicodemus, a religious person, right? And he, as he's talking to Nicodemus, you know what he tells him? Hey, dude, you seem like you got it all together, but you need to be born again because nobody who's, uh, the person who's never been born again will never see the kingdom of God. He said, you're doing, to the best of your knowledge, everything you know to do to be religious, but you need to start seeing things the way I see things. And without the Holy Spirit in you, you can't do that. And so when he was talking to a religious person, he would usually say that. When he was talking to the rich young ruler whose heart was just set on money, and and, and money controlled him, he idolized it. He said, hey, here's what you need to do. You need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. What what is he doing? Is he just trying to be a punk to, to this rich young ruler? No, he's trying to help this rich young ruler realize that what he's trying to fill his life with And what he's searching for fulfillment in will never give him that. So that when the rich young ruler walks away, he walks away sad, but he walks away with clarity that this is what it means to follow God. I need to give God my life, and I have to give up a love for money and love God. And and he walks away at least clearly knowing that he clearly doesn't want to follow Christ. That's what Paul's after, is that the gospel would be so clearly presented that people would clearly know what it means to follow Jesus and what it doesn't mean to follow Jesus. It's important that we pray for clarity and boldness when it comes to sharing the gospel. So letter C is the practical question for you. What is your next step when it comes to being faithful in prayer? Uh, For you, what what does it look like? Maybe for my wife and I, it was us sitting down and thinking through, hey, what do we want to spend time intentionally praying for persistently you know we want to spend time praying for our kids we want to spend time praying for our church we want to spend time praying for uh, leaders to be developed for people to come to know the Lord for God to give us influence with lost people in this community around the world for God to raise up missionaries for God to bless the work of of church planners all around what do you what are you spending time intentionally praying for we would love to have that conversation with you talk about it in your small group Talk about it with a pastor. We'd love to to help you and guide you along that way. The second thing Paul wants us to be faithful in is not only prayer, but he wants us to be a faithful witness, a faithful witness. If you bounce back to to verse 5 and 6, here's what he says. He says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So so again, he's speaking towards outsiders. He wants our lives uh, to to make a difference in in, in the lives of people outside the church, right? So he's not talking about the gathering of believers. He's saying, hey guys, I want you guys to be faithful witnesses in the way you live your lives outside of Sunday morning church or outside of the gathering. He says, I want your conversation to be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Why, Paul? So that you can answer the questions that people have. You know, when it comes to answering people's questions, it's one thing to answer their question. It's another thing to answer their question in a way that I actually hear what you're saying. When your life is seasoned with salt, that means you're flavorful. That means that you live your life in such a way that matches what you say. And when your lives are full of grace, that means you're not arrogant, you're not pushy, you you love people with the same grace and you give them the same grace that God's given you. When you speak, people listen, right? Have you ever met somebody who just knows a lot about the Bible and then they tell you an answer to the Bible and it's like, that's true, but man, like, why, why don't you do that, you know? Or they tell you it in such a way that it's like, Golly, I would never listen to that person, right? For, for, for many of us, Paul doesn't want us to predict the message of Christ. He wants us to live in such a way that when we speak, people are like, oh, wow, yeah, that's why you do that. Or he wants us to speak uh, in, in raw, honest transparency. Hey, like, I'm struggling with this too. He don't want us to act like we have it all together if we don't. To tell y'all that I'm the most faithful person in prayer would be a lie. 
So what do I tell you? Hey, I've struggled here too. And so what I've tried to do is intentionally put disciplines in my life so that I can grow in this area. And I don't, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to grow. All of us have areas of our life where we struggle and we don't need to try to act arrogant and try to act prideful. We just need to be honest and say, hey, I'm working on this. Why don't we work on this together? So he says, be faithful, be a faithful witness. Paul's talking about being a good witness outside of the church. Letter A, here's the thing we got to realize, and this is what Paul wants us to know. We are witnesses everywhere we go. In this, per- in this world, you, no matter who you are, where you go, you are a witness. So the question becomes, are you a good witness or a bad witness? What is a witness? Well, think about a, a court case. When a witness gets on the stand, what do they do? They're testifying to the truth. They're saying, hey, I'm a firsthand eyewitness, and this is what I saw. Or they're testifying to someone's character. There is an experience there. They're saying something with their actions and with their words. And so what Paul's saying is that, listen, uh, your life is a witness everywhere you go. The way you talk is a witness. The way you live is a witness. The way you respond when you're pressed is a witness. He says the question we need to begin to ask ourselves is, are we a good witness or a bad witness? Are we testifying to the truth of God or are we testifying to the truths of the world? When people look at our lives and what we say, are we representing God or are we representing the ways of the world? Uh, it's been so encouraging. One of the things that I love as a pastor, just like today with Dustin and Thomas, is watching God use people. It, it brings me way more joy. Like when, and, and this is the God honest truth. When, I, when we have baptism Sundays and I don't have to get into the baptismal and baptize people, I'm more fired up on that Sunday than I am on any Sunday. I mean, I still love to lead people to Christ, but when I see y'all going out into your workplaces having conversations about Jesus with people, leading them to Christ outside of Sunday mornings, dude, I just get fired up. I mean, that's what, that's what keeps me going. When I hear about a conversation of a guy getting an intern and he's like, yeah, the intern came in, we were just talking about Jesus and uh, he, he said he'd never been saved, so wanted to be saved. I led him to Jesus and I'm like, oh, what? Are you serious right now? You know, like for me, that's what it's all about. The book of Acts, when God begins to do incredible things in the church and in his kingdom, it's not about a professional coming up here and speaking. It is God lighting people on fire, bouncing out into this community and beginning to minister to people all throughout this community. That's what it means to be a faithful witness everywhere that you go. The question is, what does it look like? Let's, let's dive into that. I, I was listening to, uh, you know, many of y'all know Kanye West, who was like a, a huge uh, s- uh, singer and, and entertainer and all this stuff. And he's very skilled in what he does. He was definitely living for, for not God for a while. But, um, and now I don't really know what he's living for. But there, there was a time in his life where, um, you know, he, he had, had come to faith. This guy out in California had been spending time with him, sharing the gospel and uh, he, he, he basically got saved, as most people would say, right? And so, uh, and, and, he, and one of the things is he, he would spend time with this pastor, and this pastor was discipling him, and, and, and I heard him on a talk show. I don't remember it was, who was it with, Saturday Night Live or whatever. And uh, they asked him, they said, hey, so Kanye, are you now going to be a Christian artist? You know, you're about to blow through the Christian artist world because of your abilities to do this. Are you now going to be a Christian artist? And he said, man, I don't know. I'm going to be a Christian everything. And I I was like, yes, that's it, right? Whether you like Kanye or not or whether he is or not, here's the thing. What he said is true. When we become a Christian, we don't just become a Christian in an area. We become a witness, a Christian in every area of our life. Since Colossians 3, Paul has really transitioned to talking about this with us. He wants us to be a witness in every area of our life. And notice, a witness is more about who you are than what you do. Does that make sense? He's speaking identity-type language. Witness is this 
He wants this being a witness for Jesus to be who you are, not just something that you do. And he's kind of, since Colossians 3, he's talked to us about putting off the old man and putting on the new man, throwing off sin and putting on holiness and obedience. He's talked to us about marriage and our marriage being a ministry, our marriage representing Jesus' love on how we love one another, how we parent our kids being a representation of how God loves us as a father, right? So he wants every area of our life who we are as a dad, who we are as a husband, who we are in the workplace, who we are in life in general, in every environment that we're in, to be a witness to the truth of who God is. It's that picture that when people hear you speak or they see you live, they want people to say, wow, look what Jesus has done in this person's life. This is, even when people aren't looking, he don't do it for the boss. It's like he's working for somebody else. You're like, yeah, actually, I am. I'm working for Christ because Christ is the Lord of my life. That's the picture of what it means to be a faithful witness. Write this down. Being a witness is a challenge to simply identify the people you see and know and to live with gospel intentionality among them every day. Right? So not only is it about who you are, now we're beginning to take our mind into the mission field. Being a witness is a challenge to simply identify, begin to look for the people you see and know, and to begin to live with gospel intentionality among them every day. So let's get practical. Let's make a plan right here. Me and you sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, make a plan. Tim Keller talks about it this way. He, he, he kind of brings this down to networks and tasks, right? If you're a type A person, you're going to love this. Each of us in our life have networks or spheres of influence. So if we want to be a faithful witness, we need to begin to examine some of this stuff, right? So the first network that we have is our uh, family network, right? So uh, this would be the family that you have at home. The second one is our vocational network. These are the people that you work with. The third one would be our commercial network. That's the businesses that we frequent, right? So if you're like me, uh, you eat at the same places, Chick-fil-A, you go to Starbucks, Papa Bucks, that's about all I need in life, right? So um, those are the things that, that you do, geographical network, the neighbors around you, the people that you see around where you live, and then finally your relational network, the friends that you may have, right? Doesn't necessarily have to be your neighbors, these are people uh, that you, you cultivate, whether it's at the ballpark or uh, whether it's uh, just intentionally making friends with people, right? Not every person has the same amount of people in their network, but we all have a network, right? Some folks are shy, some folks are outgoing, but think about, uh, think about those networks, family, vocational, commercial, geographical, relational. Now, I want you to think about the people in those networks that you have, and here's what I want you to commit to doing for them. Five things. Be intentional. Five tasks. Number one, pray for them. Pray for them. Paul wants you to pray for them. Because God can do things in their life that you can't do. So pray for them. Number two, serve them. We're going to talk about what it means to be intentional about serving in a minute, but serve these people. Give gospel-centered reading to them, right? So talk to them about what you're reading. The Bible, a Bible study, a book about God, Christ. Strategically think about what they need to hear and give it to them. You don't have to be weird and like leave something in their drawer, but... Have a conversation with them enough to, to leave them something and just say, man, this has been helpful for me. Do you want to read it together? You know, start a book club. Invite them. Invite them to church. Invite them to small group. Be intentional. Try to invite them into your life. You won't reach people that don't, you don't do life with. Five, speak the gospel to them. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. So if we want to see God transform somebody's life, we have to have gospel conversations. Listen, I know this is scary for a lot of people. Billy, I don't know enough. Billy, they're going to laugh at me. Billy, what are they going to think about me? Billy, I'm not perfect. Billy, you got all the excuses in the world. I do too. But at the end of the day, God's asked us to be a faithful witness. We can't be a faithful witness if we're not talking about the person that we're bearing witness for. Talk about Jesus. Talk about his forgiveness in your life. Talk about what he's doing in your life. Talk about how he's using you. Talk about what he's done for you. Just talk about it. And when we begin to do that, God will do some incredible things. So what is it? Let her see. 
The last question is, what's your next step when it comes to being a faithful witness? Right? So not only what is your next step when it comes to being faithful in prayer, but what is your next step when it comes to being a faithful witness? Is it to be intentional? Is there a sin in your life that you need to deal with that's keeping you from being the witness that God's called you to be? Is there a specific area of your life where you struggle to be a witness? Talk to somebody. Join a small group where you can walk through those things with someone else. Here's the thing that I know. People that are personally fired up about Jesus are the people that make the best witnesses. When God's doing something in your life, you don't even have to try. You just light up and bear witness, right? You, you want to talk about him, right? So for some of us, it, do, it starts with God lighting a fire in us. God, help me. God, I want to know you. God, I want you to be worth sharing in my life and going back and cultivating, fanning the flame of the spirit that's in you. The third and final thing that Paul gives us in here is faithful service, verse 7 through 18. I won't read it again, but it's an entire list of people. He mentions a number of faithful saints who exemplify a life of faithful service. And here's the thing I love. This is what gets me fired up. This is basically Paul getting to the end of Colossians, and he's saying, hey, guys, God's working, and here's the squad that he's working through. Let me tell you about what they're doing. Let me tell you about uh, my boy Epaphras. He's wrestling for you in prayer. Like right now, as I write this letter, he is wrestling for you in prayer. And here's what he's praying for you. He's praying that you would grow and that you would grow to be fully mature in Christ. Listen, uh, my girl Nympha is over here in this town and she's hosting the church in her house. We don't have a place to meet. She said, hey, bring them all. Come on, we can meet in my house. God's blessed me with this house. Let's meet in it. She's serving in that way. Hey, this is my boy Onesimus. He was a runaway slave. He was a bond servant that probably stole something from his master and left. He got to Rome. Paul led him to Christ. And now God is beginning to use him, has transformed his life, and is using him in an incredible way. You got Archippus. He says, man, hey, you're in this church, and God has gifted you. You need to quit sitting back, and you need to get in the game, right? He's, he's calling him out. You got Tachikis, who he says, I'm sending Tachikis to you as a messenger. He's a mailman. He's carrying probably the letter of Colossians to them. Right? And then he talks about another guy named Demas. You don't want to be like Demas. Demas later uh, in, in Timothy uh, abandons the faith because of his love for the world is what it says. It says he was battling between his love for God and his love for the world. And so Paul goes back to where we started in the beginning. Every person has a purpose. Saved people, letter A, saved people serve people. Saved people serve faithfully serve people. When we understand what God has done for us, we can't help but mimic it in the lives of other people. Serving is such a litmus test for us. If our hearts are not to serve the people around us, then our hearts are not close to God. We don't grow closer to God and grow further away from serving people in our life. Our relationships with God aren't healthy if our hearts are not serving, right? It's why if we, we struggle to serve, then we, we don't need to just press through the serving, maybe in some ways, but we need to press into God so that God can begin to transform our hearts and our minds because he's our example in that. Letter B, what does it look like to be a faithful servant? You just got to join the list. Listen, God has gifted you. It may be hospitality. It, it may be shepherding people in a small group. It may be serving in some capacity within our church. It may be just saying, hey, I don't know where I'm gifted, but I just want to be a part of what God's doing. Hey, do y'all, is there anything that you guys need with the church? Or maybe it's in the workplace, or maybe in your family, wherever it is. Hey, I just want to become a servant. I want to serve more tomorrow than I did today. And you just wake up every day and just say, God, help me become the servant that I need to be. Listen, the thing that I long for in our church is that when we think about our relationships with the people that are sitting to the right and left for us, I want you to think about that person as a partner in ministry. Like That's the Bible language that comes with a church. It's friendship, but it's friendship partnered in the gospel. So it's like, hey, 
I know this person's living for Jesus where they're at. I'm living for Jesus. We're partners. We're co-laborers, co-workers. They bring something to the table. I bring something to the table. You know, 90% of churches, uh, 10 people, uh, really 10% of the people do all the work of the church. It should be the opposite, right? God has gifted. Listen, many of you guys have believed a lie that God can't use you or you don't have any gifts to bring to the table or you don't have time or resources that are helpful to the church. It is a lie. Like there's one thing that remains when it's all said and done. And it's the work of eternity. Like you'll never regret giving your life to the mission of God. Because everything else fades away. But as we move closer and closer towards eternity till the day we meet Christ, that's what comes to the top. So God wants us to ask, Paul wants us to ask, are we a faithful servant? So personally, let her see what is your next step when it comes to being a faithful servant? For you, is it a belief issue? Is it that you don't believe that you will find life when you lay your life down? That's what Jesus teaches. He says, listen, As you begin to serve others, you find more life than you do if you served yourself for the rest of your life. So for some of us, it's a belief issue. For others of of us, we believe that lie of the enemy, that God can't use us. It is a lie. For some of us, it's just a sin issue. We, We don't realize that sin in us is selfishness. It's the opposite of service. So as a Christian, we have to begin to fight that and say, man, if, if, if my life a direction or my feelings or my mindset is all about me, then I need to bring this and let God transform it and save me, one, or I need to bring this sin up under the Lordship of Christ and ask him to help me with it. And for some of us, it's a heart issue, and this is where I'll close. Listen, when we think about these three things, prayer, witness, service, there's a reason that Paul is encouraging this church to pray to live a life that's a witness to Christ and to serve. Because he knows if we're following Jesus, this will naturally be the overflow of our life. It's not that we don't have to work at it, we do. But when God's grace gets a hold of us, that's how it plays out. We wanna be in a relationship with God. We wanna talk to him. We we wanna witness to others. We want others to experience what we have. And we wanna give our life to what he's doing. So where are you at today? Right where you are. I just want you to bow your head. What is it that God's putting on your heart? What is your next step today? Maybe for some of us, it's to begin to be intentional. Maybe we have been before, but maybe today's a day where we need to draw a line in the sand and say, Lord, I'm not going to live the same way I've been living. Today, I want to begin to walk in your ways. I want to be what Paul would call a faithful saint a person whose life is focused on Christ. And for for many of us, we may say, Billy, that's not me. And you you may be saying, Billy, I don't have a relationship with Christ. Well, today's the gospel is available. All we have to do is respond to it. God said he loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you so that you didn't have to do it on your own, so that Christ could be in you and work through you. If you're in here this morning, you say, Billy, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I want one. Would you just lift your hand and say, Billy, that's me. This morning, I want God to work in my heart. I know I can't become what he's asked me to do on my own, but today, I need his help. So, Father, would you do what only you can do, God, and that's change our heart. Lord, we want to be faithful, God. We want to be a church that is mesmerized by your grace. God, we want to be a people that reflects you to those around us. God, we want to know you. We want to walk with you. God, would you help us? God, we need you so much. We're not faithful people without your spirit. So God, would you fan to flame the Holy Spirit inside of us? God, create in us your heart. God, lead us. Lord, protect us from our own sin so that we can be the people you've called us to be. Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. We'll see you back next week.